day. So for our JSL talk series, we have a special sharing uh, session with uh, from Dr. Dominika Govebiska. Did I say it right? Yeah. Thank you. I had lessons from Dr. Shurin this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so here in the Department of Landscape Architecture, occasionally we organize talks or forums, not just for our students, but also for the other members of the faculty. And most of the time, these talks are, are open to all. So I believe as a university, the dissemination of information is very important and is one of our responsibilities. So welcome all. And thank you for taking some time off your busy schedule to receive some information uh, from our speaker today. So we are honored to have with us uh, Dr. Dominica, a lecturer and artist and landscape architect from the Academy of Fine Arts, Gdansk, Poland. With us in the seminar room today is also our Dean, Professor Madia Technologist, Joe Specialist, Dr. Muhammad Johari Muhammad Yusuf. Tongue twister that one. And our guest, Madam Barbara Kosinska from the Embassy of the Republic of Poland. So, Madam Barbara is the second secretary of the Political and Economic Section, the Embassy of Poland. And we also have our head of landscape architecture department, Professor Madia Dr. Shurin Faris. And also, students from, I think, various MSKK programs and lecturers uh, have, I can see, we have Dr. Adam, Dr. Khair, Mr. Imran, beside me, so serious. And also Dr. Hane. Okay. Oh, Dr. Hane. Yes, we have Dr. Hane from UKM. We have Dr. Hane. Welcome to the faculty. So I would like to share some information uh, with everyone about Dr. Dominica. So Dr. Dominica is a landscape architect and a special planner by education. In 2018, she defended her doctoral thesis in the specialization of environmental protection and shaping at the University of Warmia and Missouri in Ozzin. Is that it? Perfect. <laughs> I should move to Poland. <laughs> so uh, she is an interdisciplinary designer, an educator, uh, creator, activist, and also founder of the Landscape Art Society Foundation. So Dr. Dominica has participated in many national and international cooperation agreements, projects, grants, and conferences related to the protection and shaping of natural and cultural heritage and the promotion and creation of culture and art, including La Notre Landscape Forum and the Learning Landscapes Project. So since 2014, she has been cooperating with the most, uh, most important world institutions dealing with topics related to landscape architecture. Uh, Dr. Dominica has also participated in many national and international exhibitions, including in Malaysia, Germany, and Italy. So, finally, she has a dog named Casca, and she loves the band Red Hot Chili Peppers. So, I can tell that she's from my generation. So, therefore, without further ado, I will turn the mic to Dr. Dominica, and please join me in welcoming her. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Once again, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a great honor that the Academy of Fine Arts in Gdańsk is part of this wonderful event. And thank you so much for a very, very warm welcome here. Uh, I really feel like home here at UPM, <laughs> and it's thanks to all of you, so thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> Before we start the lecture, I know, you know, the Malaysian way it's food and, you know, you love to eat. So I'd like to share with all of you uh, some Polish sweets. So I give one and then I pass. So please, you know, take one, eat and, uh, and try it. I hope that you like it. So please, I start with you and then you can pass it further. Uh, yeah. This is something that I learned here that food's everywhere, which is perfect, you know, because landscape, it's also about food and food is an experience that we can share together. Um, okay, before we start just one or maybe two things, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Shurin Faris uh, for this long cooperation. Uh, so thank you so much, Shurin, for everything and you make all of this happen. So. Thank you. 
And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Barbara Kosinska from the embassy. Thank you so much for your support and for the cooperation. And I have the small gift for the embassy. So, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so after this a bit uh, longer introduction, um, we start, whoa, what happened here? Okay, okay. Uh, we start with the, today's talk, uh, which is topic is co-creation in terms of landscape, art, and society. I would like to share with you uh, one of our experiences in a project called Learning Landscape, which base was uh, partici local society participation uh, in creating landscape art and, of course, society. So today uh, we will take on the roads of philosophers and I try to work with you to find answer to questions like why we are here. I think I know that this one is a bit more general, right? So probably for centers, people try to uh, find the answer for this question. Of course, we're not going to find the whole answer, but we try a, a bit uh, get ourselves closer to this. Uh, and of course, what do we need as a society? What's its co-creation? And how can we work together with local societies? Uh, one of my favorite lecturers used to say that good lecture, it's like therapy. So it makes doubts disappear. Uh, and of course it answers some question, but more questions should appear after that. So I hope that this is just the beginning of your reflections and that you will continue to ponder on the idea of collaboration and co-creation. Um, why we're here? Uh, so before I start to answer about uh, on this question, I would like to address more. So um, have you ever wondered why homes, hotels and apartments with window overlooking on greenery and plants are significantly more expensive than others? Or why sanatorius, hotel resorts, holiday resorts, despite enormous pressure of development, are situated among greenery and parks? Or why our properties prices are higher even 30% more if they are located around nature? Uh, this is, uh, it leads us to the question, why is nature so essential to us? And for all this question, there is one simple answer, which is biophilia. The term biophilia was introduced by Foreman in the uh, 70s last century, who indicated that it is people needs to draw closer to nature. It was developed more by uh, Edward Osborne Os uh, Wilson, who uh, take this topic and uh, indicated it into the book titled Biophilia. Uh, nature has accompanied humans since the dawn of time, and what's more, people accompany nature since the dawn of time. So the biophilia hypothesis is that uh, is the belief that humans have an uh, innate tendency to seek connections with nature and other living beings, living forms. The theory of biophilia, mainly advocated by Edward Wilson, indicates that Homo sapiens lived very close, connected to nature for a million years. 
they experience a natural need for contact with other living beings, which evolved into an initiate characteristic. So from that perspective, contact with other uh, living beings like plants or animals is as important as our contact with other people. Uh, what is also very important that biophilia, it's not knowledge, it's not science. It's something that like instinct that we are born with. So we cannot learn biophilia. We can uh, enhance it or make it, you know, um, try to uh, be more aware of our contact with nature. But we already have this inside us. Um, it's a tendency to love nature, which is born in each of us. So from that perspective, uh, humans should be defined not only as a social being, but also as social and natural animals or beings. Contact with nature is important uh, as contact with other people. There's why people who spend time among plants, animals, in forests or gardens have a special sense of balance and peace. Therapists, doctors among the world, uh, they also uh, notice this tendency. That's why we have those famous uh, prescriptions in Scandinavia uh, for forest walks or gardening instead of medications. Uh, especially, uh, it's good for people who uh, who has problems with anxiety or depression. So instead of giving them medications, they supposed to spend more time with the nature. Uh, it's difficult, of course, to talk about nature when we sit in the room without with closed windows. There are windows there, uh, but uh, still, uh, you can imagine the feelings that you have when you go outside and you see wonderful flowers or beautiful river or hills or whatever. So it already probably brings smile to your faces, uh, and uh, you see how biophilia it's very strong in each of us. Uh, in Netherlands, the study conducted involved more than 300,000 adults and children showed uh, that uh, spending more time with nature instead of in concrete city centers helps us to reduce stress and also it, uh, sorry for that, uh, and also it helps us uh, to a lower risk of at least 15 diseases, including heart problems, diabetes, muscle pain, migraines, asthma, and also allergies. Sometimes we think that if we have allergies, we should avoid nature. Uh, and of course, you need to you know, check with your allergologist and other doctors. But in uh, modern therapies, uh, it's also very good to exposure for nature. I have a pollination allergy and uh, yeah, I'm landscape architect, so you can see that it might be a problem in this uh, in this area, but still uh, spending more time with nature, exposing for its good influence, helped me to deal also with, uh, with this problem. Uh, so, of course, before you start to experimenting on yourself, uh, check with your doctor if, if everything's fine. But he, you can see uh, and you can seek many uh, literature uh, and many, many research that shows that it will improve your health. Okay. So biophilia, it's very easy when you see something like this, like a Scottish cow. I think that they are a bit uh, famous in the internet. Everyone loves them, you know, the French and everything. So it's easy to love that kind of picture also. Butterflies, flowers, I think it's cliche uh, in terms of nature. So you already have this warm feelings about nature. But when we go to this picture, basically it's a butterfly, but step before it gets its wings, probably some of you may feel a bit more discomfort. Maybe some chill bumps will appear on your hands and you'll have this uh, urge to, I don't know, to do something with your back. Uh, but it's on the edge, it's still manageable. But when we go to picture like this, it's only picture, uh, but probably some of you will be more 
you want to get get out of this situation and you don't want to deal with that kind of uh, animals that much. So in nature, everything it's in balance. When you have this natural love in yourself, which is called biophilia, you also have something which is called biophobia. It's totally natural. It's also in us and it helps people to live in the world dominated by nature. It is our na instinct to be afraid of uh, huge animals or dangerous situation to survive. Uh, so it's fear, it may pr produce, uh, it may uh, conduct anxiety or dread. Uh, and of course it's natural, but nowadays we live in uh, places very, uh, sec um, very distant to nature. So it uh, produces more stress in this term and makes that people feel more uh, and more afraid about uh, nature. Uh, it's amplified, this imbalance, it's amplified by our lifestyle. Um, we don't know nature, so we fear it. We feel threatened and distance ourselves even more. We want to restore a sense of security, and this fear will cause an increase in the level of acceptance for actions aimed uh, at resorting such security. On one hand, we know that trees provide oxygen and have a positive impact on building urban microclimate. So we, of course, love trees every time when, uh, or many times when uh, local government wants to catch trees, we go and we protest and we want to protect uh, trees in cities. But on the other hand, we are willingly uh, led to remove them from cities. Uh, in Poland, we say, some people say uh, that uh, trees uh, are dangerous and they cause car accidents, not high speed, but trees, you know, it's, uh, you can easily imagine how um, not very, you cannot take serious that kind of uh, uh, stuff. And uh, some people say that trees make mess because they fall, the leaves fall and everything. Uh, and most of this, it's based on this fear. I see that also you have similar problems in Malaysia. I Google it a bit and there's many articles about this. Also yesterday I visited Kiel uh, Center uh, with one of uh, lecturers, Marek Kozłowski, and he told me that now it's very popular to remove trees near uh, roads to make them bigger and bigger. <laughs> and also there are many people who are against but still the approval for that kind of uh, practice, it's uh, very popular. And as we all know, trees protect biodiversities, they create biodiversities, they reduce stress level, they are good for our mental and physical health, they increase uh, value of properties, uh, maintaining stormwater, cool the atmosphere, cool the, uh, the atmosphere of the whole city, uh, which I think that here in Malaysia might be very important. Also, they filter the air and, uh, and help you uh, to have more healthier environment uh, in uh, our cities. Uh, so, of course, uh, they lower the temperature, which is very important. Um, I came here like, you know, you know that I'm from Europe, so we walk a lot in Europe. Uh, and uh, every time when I'm walking here on the road, everyone's just asking if, if it's everything okay with me. Sometimes people stop their car and ask if, do I need help or something like this, if everything's okay, which is very, very, very nice of you all. Uh, thank you for, for the concern. And I say, no, no, I'm just walking. I like to walk. And uh, when I ask uh, all of you here, why you don't do this? And most people say it's because of temperature. And of course it's high temperature, but in uh, Europe, we also have like during summer, it's 36, 40. In Italy, it's 40 plus in the summer and people also walk. 
And uh, I think the main problem is that you don't have a proper infrastructure for this. There's no uh, walking path, no biking path that people can easily use. And for that, also the critical infrastructure are trees. Uh, because without trees, there is no uh, natural pooling systems in the cities. Uh, so if you can think about more complex uh, strategy for this, I think that you all will walk everywhere here. I have this a bit crazy dream to make some project like, you know, walking Malaysia or something like this and uh, or make Malaysia walkable. And uh, I hope that today it's crazy idea, but maybe tomorrow it will be a project and in 10 years uh, it will be just a new reality. Uh, so I hope that sometime soon we'll meet on the biking path or on the walking path or under just the tree. So let's let's see what future brings. Uh, so now we know why we're here. There are biophilia and biophobia that creates everything in the context of uh, landscape, basically. But we still don't know what we need. So I tell you what we need. <laughs> Of course, everyone needs something else, but there are some general rules. rules. Uh, first, uh, I just want to remind all of you that there are different, of course, uh, criteria uh, for space division, but I think that there are two most important. One is in terms of um, owner of the land, so it might be public, semi-public, private, or semi-private, and also about... Uh, the uh, the way that you can use this space. So if it's closed or more open. And for us, in terms of uh, landscape architecture, uh, uh, landscape architecture, and also creating healthy cities, uh, we the public spaces are the most important because it's the heart and veins of each cities. This is the pl public space is the place where all uh, social interactions might appear. Uh, this is the place where everyone is equal. It's no one's property. It's property for all of us. So we can feel like the owner, but also like a person who needs to take care about this specific place. And uh, of course, greenery, it's one of the most important part of the public spaces in each cities. And uh, role of greenery, it might be obvious, but I want to remind you uh, that it's, of course, the social educational role, uh, which helps promote civil responsibility and community pride, uh, serve as outdoor classrooms for environmental educations, or encourage community to engage uh, in maintaining local environment. It's also, it has also economic role uh, which, like I uh, said before, increase the value of uh, property. Uh, it also provides economic opportunities for local residents. It may produce and uh, contribute to food security, which is also very important now. Uh, creating green, common green spaces helps people to deal with also poverty, uh, because if you are allowed to produce your own food, uh, it's better for your uh, economic uh, system in this smaller scale. Of course, it's scientific role. I think that this is something that you're all uh, fond of, and and this is what we, sorry, what we do at universities. Of course, biological role, which is connected with uh, measurable impact of uh, plants and animals on our health. Uh, Aesthetic role, uh, one of my professor always says that uh, if you build something very, very ugly or something not aesthetic, uh, the easiest way to do something with this is to plant a lot of greenery around uh, because it will, you know, compact uh, deal with this situation. And uh, of course, it's shaping new conditions uh, to grow. Um, Green areas, of course, reduce negative impact of metropolitan environment. Uh, it uh, helps to mitigate climate changes uh, and also helps with reducing noise pollution. And uh, 
air and the dust pollution too. Uh, if we think about our needs, uh, thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is, I think, quite uh, famous and obvious, uh, we may easily notice that all of these needs, whatever we pick from this box, we can uh, we can um, we can fulfill those needs with greenery and healthy environment of life. If we think about physiological needs, uh, for instance, access to clean water or air or food. Of course, green spaces may provide this. If we think about safety, like uh, health safe, also a uh, clean, good environment will provide our health. Uh, even in terms of love and belonging, like uh, making friendship, uh, family, or other connections, in public green areas, we can make all of this and we can make community and meet other people and interact with them, which increase our self-esteem and also helps us with self-actualization. Uh, so, of course, uh, greenery has a huge impact on our health. Uh, I checked that in Malaysia, the stress level as darker means the stress level is higher. So basically, whole Malaysia has huge problem, you know, with this uh, stress problem. And also, it might be something that we can solve with creating more complex green structures in the cities. Um, when we, I can go on. Yeah, no? Okay. Um, uh, the the other factor it's of course living environment now we're facing climate changes and this crisis so of course restoring uh restoring uh, storm water might be also very important factor that greenery may help us to deal with and of course uh, in in Poland or in Malaysia, we have a lot of problems with flash floods. Uh, I know that we have this rain season, so there's a lot of rain. But normally, the environment try to you know deal with this in some other ways. But sometimes now we have those heavy rains like this this flash floods and so on. So it changes a bit because of climate change and the impact of climate change. We feel like I told you now we have like thirty plus forty plus during the summer, which is not normal for us and we try to adapt with uh, with this uh, so of course it's uh, we facing those problems in Europe but it's all around the world and especially in uh, in uh, in countries like this where you have those you know very hot climate with a lot of water it might be uh, on the on one hand, we have problem with this. On the other hand, it's uh, ground erosion and uh, drought. So uh, consequences of climate change, of course, there are higher temperatures, droughts and fires, floods, uh, soil erosion, biodiversity loss and change, uh, changing uh, of marine environment because the temperature of ocean is getting higher and higher, and so on and so on. So what is not adaptation uh, for the climate change? It's definitely not cutting trees anywhere. Uh, and like I already Googled it earlier, so I Googled it more. So also I, I, I feel that this is also a topic, an issue here in cities, but also outside. What it's not adaptation is removing greenery and uh, and implementing more concrete uh, in the city centers. Even if the design looks very, very nice, especially from the top uh, or on the map, sometimes it's not good for our environment because this concrete will not um, grasp the raining water, it will not filtrate it. Uh, also, it will hide the temperature on the ground, like I uh, show you on the previous slides. Uh, the temperature on concrete will be way higher than, uh, for in instance, under the trees. And there were like European examples. So of course, now I, I'd like to make a review what what I've seen here. Also, huge parking lots, like we can see a lot in Malaysia. This is one uh, from uh, somewhere here in the KL uh, agglomeration. 
also uh, preparing or making new designs like this. This is the place where I visited yesterday. It was in the KL city center, uh, the huge space full of concrete and basically, and you know, some trees like this very small in this whole built structure. Uh, this tree looks very, very sad there, and uh, I just wanted, you know, to hug it or something like this, uh, or invite more uh, friends for for them. And uh, all the um, all the documents, official document, if it's European Union, a World Health Organization, uh, or other uh, world uh, institutions uh, for adaptation for climate change, the most important factor is greenery and nature. Uh, so, uh, to sum up this part, if we have a problem with climate change, the answer is nature of course there we need something more but nature may help uh, with creating good living condition answer once again nature health nature aesthetic developments or creating more uh, sustainable tourism which is also connected with uh, economic situation uh, the answer for all of this is nature and landscape uh, also, uh, on these two, probably you all know, you all know these spots, right? Everyone knows them. There's Central Park and Highline, both in uh, New York. Uh, very, uh, very noticeable investitions. And uh, what's more, greenery in the city may maintain value and also brings more tourist traffic to the city. Even in that very uh, I hope that you'll hear me all, even in this very, very dense structure, look how dense is the city, there's still a huge part of greenery. And the apartments among, like around the Central Park, they are most expensive apartment in the whole world. And still, they are not even the pressure of development stay on this line. So it's not pushing there. And probably if you build something here, it will be even more uh, valuable, right, in terms of money. So, but they keep it untouched. This is the different example because uh, there was the old line uh, and they built some green structure on this, like some kind of park or uh, green zones. And this <coughs> uh, new development brings more, uh, more in the neighborhood. So. Uh, in the neighborhood, which was very problematic and needed uh, needed some kind of action, uh, using green infrastructure there helps uh, to helps with um, changing the conditions and helps with revitalization. So it is also very important to think about greenery in different process. Tourism, sustainable, natural, or nature-based, it's a very important factor of creating economic value these days. Um, most of these uh, tourist ideas, they are based on environment and landscape and also creating a good condition for mental and physical activity and health. Um, Natural cultural tourism, this is something that appeared uh, like a few years ago, and uh, it also used uh, tools and it, uh, it used nature and landscape and environment uh, to bring people to, to new places. And like I said, tourism is the most profitable activity in the world. So we also need to take under consideration this. And here also you have huge potential for creating nature-based tourism, even in the KL Center. Uh, but also, of course, you have those wonderful natural, natural parks, but also everyday spaces that they are uh, very desirable for that kind of activities. And what's more, I was, you know, I'm always amused about this space and I really love it. This is the Echo Park in KL, which is basically the jungle inside of the city. So the potential, it's huge. 
the only thing that we need to take under consideration is how we can use it uh, in the future. So instead of developing those spaces, we can use them in different ways. Uh, so what's the most important? Of course, context. Uh, what kind of context do you usually consider before you start your designs? Come on. What kind of context? What do you think about before you start, before you make the first line on your design, what will be what you may think of? History, right, of the spot, of the place. What else? It might be culture, of course. Yeah, any, any more, more ideas? Geography, yes, that's right. Yes, also, yes, yes, like, you know, the whole environment, nature, mm -hmm. anything else? Sorry? Yes, also. So we have many, many contexts, right? Sp spatial, historical, legal, social, political, landscape contexts, and many, many more. And basically, this is all that we try to focus before we start, start design. In the project that I will tell you about in a minute, uh, I will tell more about landscape, art, and society context, and how, to, based on this, we can create new approach of working uh, with the local society. So what is co-creation? It's something that it comes from society to the project and from project to the society, because we make this with local factor. This is one of primary schools we built. Um, we built a garden there. So kids taking care during the breaks instead. And of course they have some time to play. So it's not like they are forced to work there, but they can go and take care of their own garden. Also pick fruits from uh, or vegetables and use them uh, for lunch. Etc. And they they really they doing it willingly. So at the beginning, uh, the their teachers they try to you know uh, in, involve more try to involve them more into this process. And now they need to sign the list who's going to take care of it each week because they all want to do this same time. So. Uh, it was very generic, but you know, uh, back to the to the project that I would like to tell you about. It it's called Learning Landscape. It was Erasmus Plus uh, scientific teaching project. We started it in 2019. It's supposed to be two years uh, project, but because of pandemic, uh, we need to extend it a bit. It's strategic partnership coordinated by one of Polish uh, of Polish of European universities, University in Nitra in Slovakia, uh, but also with partners from different European countries like uh, Croatia, Poland, Netherlands, uh, Germany, and the project aimed to support capacity building for democratic vision in the context of spatial des design education. Uh, the approach builds on emerging methodology, methodology called learning landscapes process and uses participatory digital tools for collective knowledge sharing. And we also create landscape online laboratories. Uh, the main um, objectives of the project was to open universities uh, to their communities. Uh, to prepare university staff to be facilitators, uh, to take a role of facilitators uh, in, uh, in, in terms of creating landscape and landscape processes. A uh, very important part of this project was to include students. So uh, we work together like professionals, lecturers, students, local community, uh, and uh, other stakeholders all in this project. And also, it was very important to open up the learning landscape process when they are, you know, in this county pain phase, they live down there in the ground. So we don't need to build any specific infrastructure. We just need to take care that that kind of spots will not disappear from the cityscape. 
So also we wanted to use utility plants, but not in this very designed way, but we found a spot in the city where we can make green uh, wild pantries uh, with species that we can eat. So uh, also we, we found spots where there was a lot of roses. How is rose in Malaysian? The word rose, how is it? Yeah, rose as well. Uh, okay, so maybe with this, how is nettle in Malaysian? <laughs> You don't know. Okay, so I tried. To, okay, so we found spots with more nettles and also linden trees that you can use for food production, uh, and also it's good for pollinators uh, and oaks, uh, and of course birch trees and dandelions. Do you have any name for dandelion? I'm using it to learn more words in. Yeah. Same. Ah, okay, so it's easy. <laughs> okay, and then we start asking ourselves edible landscapes, but for whom? So, of course, also for non-human beings. Uh, so it was important to introduce a bit more infrastructure, but it was more for us, for humans, to notice that our friends live there. And because you all know that they can use also the meadow and the ground, and also support baths and birds on the trees, uh, introducing more uh, wild flower meadows, which looks very picturesque, but also uh, they are indicators of biodiversity. So from this perspective, we try to go from egocent uh, egocentric system to ecocentric system, which is always a circle with all nature, uh, all humans in one uh, in one spot. Uh, this is something that we did not did yet, but we, we dream about this. Uh, it's, um, it's the next phase of the projects when we want to implement uh, different types of lights, of artificial life, a light, which is good for non-human beings, but also for humans. Our cities are highly polluted with light during the night, it also creates many physical, but also mental problems for us. And it uh, destroy uh, also our environment and uh, has very bad impact for animals and also for trees. Uh, I don't know if you heard that tree, when it falls asleep, it shrinks for even to 5% of its height. So it means that the tree sleeps. Uh, we can measure it. So it's not, you know, uh, it's not like, uh, it's something that you can easily measure. So they also need dark uh, spots to sleep. If they are not rested well, then they start to uh, disappear and die slowly. So we also need to think about these factors uh, in the cities. So this is not something that we already did implemented, but we think about this and still looking for some more uh, funds. But in Netherlands, uh, one of our partner, uh, they basically created this uh, red lights areas in the whole city. So it's totally people and non-human beings friendly. Um, also, we implement low carbon green spaces. We thought, th think about uh, water retention and restoration, but instead of, um, of doing that kind of like uh, very artificial ponds, uh, we uh, decided to introduce more trees and more meadows and green spaces because they basically work like green sponges. Uh, of course, biodiversity was a very important factor, especially because we were really close to the city center and we tried to implement the um, 330-300 rule. I don't know if you heard about this one. Uh, it's an idea implement, uh, designed by Cecil Kondik. He is a very famous uh, dendrologist from Netherlands. And during the pandemic, he was a bit bored. So he started to think about his new projects. Uh, and he uh, and one of his ideas, uh, because it's very important to see the greenery outside of our windows, 
uh, it's good for our mental health also. And during pandemic time, it was crucial sometimes because we cannot reach, you know, parks or green spaces. So we were trapped at ho at homes. Uh, so he started to work with um, with psychologists, sociologists, and uh, they measured that if uh, one see at least three trees from the window, it influence good your brain. So he started with three trees. Then he decided, okay, let's develop this idea and maybe let's think about cover at least 30% of each city by greenery, especially trees. And then uh, let's create uh, the network of parks, uh, not uh, further than 300 meters from each house. So he started with this simple picture he put it on his Facebook wall and then it went viral. And now he's implementing this idea in many Scandinavian cities, also in Spain, in Austria. So basically from very, very easy idea, we uh, came to a huge complex plan, how we can develop the city. Uh, also, green tourism and green recreation spots. Now we're working on a pocket park um, idea. Also, uh, Insta or selfie spots, because it's also very important to uh, bring more tourists to the spot. Uh, we also looked at what's going on in Paris, where they remove concrete and uh, install more green infrastructure or in Vienna. Um, also, the thing that we're working on now, they are city forests. Uh, so we start to planting some of them uh, because, as you all know, uh, being surrounded by nature, surrounded by forest, also influ it has great impact for uh, our health. So now we're inviting local society, but also other visitors for uh, park or forest bathing and also looking for forest impression spots uh, the one of the biggest um, the biggest um, on our mood boards always appear uh, appear natural parks and fort nature like this one in berlin uh, which is basically very nice, nicely made. So now we have a piece of Berlin in Gdańsk because we also use the same approach. Also natural parks like Queen's Elizabeth Olympic Park in London, which we also implemented some of ideas uh, there. And uh, Landschaft Tirsburg Nord, it's uh, amazing uh, post uh, industrial zone in Germany, which was developed into huge green area. And now it's all live for nature. So we also decided to use a similar approach in our project. Uh, we were also very under influence of Hank Hofstra and other artists, uh, which work with um, art manifestations about uh, environmental topics like this one this is in netherlands uh, and uh, it was a protest against channeling the river under the road uh, so we are not at this scale now but we work on it also uh, the other spot there's hank hofstra's work uh, where he uh, it's a protest against um, climate not adapting to the climate changes and huge concrete uh, spots so we can see those eggs so he said that the concrete area the parking area is basically like a pen so you can uh, cook eggs there so he painted them and you can also see this from google so it's noticeable even you know from the satellite because it's very very huge uh, also we were inspired by nature by land art uh, actions so then we went, uh, we decided that we need to start work. We had this first approach to the to the city, uh, to the inhabitants. Then we were inspired a lot. We read a lot. We learn a lot. 
So it was time to work. So first we uh, create another set of workshops, international workshops in Gdańsk. We work with the local society. Then we went to our partners and also exchanged the knowledge between different units and different landscape laboratories. Uh, then we evaluate our ideas, which was very stressful because it was first time when we came to the local society with first drafts. So we ask them what they think about our plans for their uh, uh, their neighborhood. And uh, it was very, very interesting experience. Um, it helps to create even stronger bond with them because uh, it was basically first time when they feel that someone wants to take care and help them to create their own uh, home. And it wasn't like, you know, we already met them. We asked them what they need. So we tried to implement everything in our projects. Uh, so it wasn't like the work from outside that we forcing them to our ideas, but we tried to work on the, on the out outcome together. Uh, so, uh, during this time, we also need some more funds. So we decided to go more to public and talk about this topic wherever we can. Uh, so we prepared art exhibitions and we, they were all dedicated to the port Island, like this one in uh, Germany, also some in Italy. Uh, we also sent some, uh, pictures to Malaysia. Uh, to Hanif's university and was looking for an identity exhibition. Uh, and it also helps to gain more attention to the project. And uh, local society, thanks to this, feel more powerful. And also it was easier for them to see that their everyday landscape is valuable and it's pretty uh, because someone else also uh, helped them to see this. Uh, it's almost finished. <laughs> uh, so we also, uh, one of our students project was about uh, looking for Insta spots. So they pick spots, like they look like every day, you know, it's just a building. It's old, uh, old building with very nice paint. So they uh, make the Instagram, um, Instagram profile for the Port Island and pick the Insta spots, the spots where you can go and make very good like fashion pictures and different types of pictures. And people start to visit it, those places. We also put it on the cultural map of our city. Uh, then, of course, we did a lot, a lot of field work during this project, make more analysis. Uh, invite our friends from different European countries for more workshops uh, like this one crazy good where we tried to make uh, art impressions about uh, stories that the local society told us about uh, for instance they told us that 50 years ago there was cows all among the island and there was one particular spot on the meadow where they gather and every owner went there and pick their cow and take it back home so you know it was 50 years ago and whole city was developed but on this island they still had cows you know so imagine like here maybe not here but maybe not from the KLC, klcc center but somewhere in the city you have huge island full of cows so we try you know to work with these their stories uh, they were also very personal stories like uh, one lady told us about her first love and the spot where they went for uh, dates and so on and also we made some tribute for uh, for that so uh, there was very it was very very local and we uh, implemented all of this in our other ideas and create some actions. So we went there and we, we act as an activist. Uh, also, we talk a lot with the local communities. We make a design uh, for a local primary school. So now they can, you know, cooperate with their landscape. Also, we establish uh, this Landscape Art Society Foundation and build more community gardens. 
And finally, we went to something which was really called creation because we start to cooperate with local society on a daily basis. So it was from this point, it wasn't like it was only our ideas, but uh, they were their ideas that they invite us to help them achieve or their goals. So we work together as partners. And the first one and very important one was uh, Landscape Festival. I show you the short movie from this event. Uh, so, ah, okay, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Ah, not working. Okay, I just closed. It's okay. Now? No, I think now. Mm hmm Of course, there was a lot of food because, you know, we are similar in these terms. So we make a mural, we build a community garden, we introduce them to many workshops and activities. We try to make a bond with, with this society. Okay, so it was the first event that we created on the port, uh, port island. Then we joined some of city huge art festivals and also uh, invited this festival to the port island. So one edition was specially dedicated to this community. And uh, then the local force start to appear. Local guides uh, start to talk their stories for the audience. So uh, it was totally idea of the local community. Uh, so they start to do those walks. Of course, at the beginning with our help, but now they are developing it by themselves. Uh, then the library uh, invite us to help them to, um, to redesign the space around the library. Also, they still need a bit help. Then the city, Council start to also involve uh, themselves with this uh, part of the city. So from basically no interest, we reach the point where city is very interested in doing some things with local community, but also developing more ideas there. Uh, so city asked us to conduct more uh, green workshops. I also have a quick movie uh, from this, so we can see the experience. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, it's, it's still my presentation. Sorry, I know, I know. Wait, wait, wait. Wait a sec. I'm just trying to. Okay, now. Mm -hmm. So we make like few meetings with local uh, society, but also with other um, people who, that were interested in this topic. And we talk about food security and, uh, and food production in the city, in the community gardens. We also make this cooking, uh, cooking workshops, uh, it always helps. So everything that we have there, it was produced in this garden, and we also uh, tried to make it a bit bigger. There was a lecture with... Uh... Yeah. So we work a lot with our hands and also there was a small exhibition with our students work during the, all of these events. And we all do this uh, outside in the field. 
like this so, because it was very reachable for for everyone from this society okay and yeah where are we at okay and we had one more experience the next local uh, council asked us to do similar thing so this is the uh, our newest part of this project uh, it's a community garden in next di district and we built it with our students last this uh, June or July or on the edge of June and July. So you see, this is the, a lot of work in the field. Uh, we need to uh, yeah, build a bit and get our hand a bit dirty. So that everyone works, lecturers, uh, students. You see that I talk about the project Erasmus Plus. So we prepared, this is the owner of the local library from this region, and he was, he's very dedicated for the local community. Uh, so he also invited us and he helped to build everything for kids. Okay. And, and we also, uh, Try this approach in different spaces uh, in Germany. In 2023, we also used similar approach uh, with a group of uh, experimental landscape. We also prepared some um, some some mindscapes, moodscapes, soundscapes. So many analyses, and then we ask people what they need. Uh, these are the figurines like Lego, but it's something something else than Lego, as you can see here. And we made a tiny protest. We asked people to make small protest transparent for those figurines and ask for their needs. So like, like here you see, let's free the river. There was also a problem with channeling river in the city center. And it appeared that most signs on this tiny, tiny protest were about this situation with the river. We cooperate in this project with, uh, uh, with the um, Council of Stuttgart region. Uh, so then we prepared, uh, there was the main problem, missing river, and then we prepared the real protest all around the city, and which was funny, was you know like a rebel protest. It was a protest signed by the Stuttgart region government. Uh, so it was very, <laughs> very, very funny uh, this situation. But uh, after this, it went very viral. Like in the whole internet, talk about this. And now the city of Nürtingen is getting back the river up. They are unchanneling the river. So uh, doing. Very, very small, because you see that the action was very small. Basically, it was figurines, some analysis, and few pieces of paper. And now we have river, we brought, bring back river to life back again. There was also another project uh, connecting, connecting with this river that we tried to make, you know, those rabbit holes from time to time because it was uh, separated from, from the audience of the city. So it was more performance uh, than real design, but still uh, it helps uh, to make a big change. So I, uh, to sum up, I may say that working with the local society, it's uh, based on small interventions that might made that might that make big 
changes because now our all people that we work together they do this by themselves and now they're inviting us as guests for you know their parties we are not uh, organizers of anything anymore uh, and we can uh, observe how they bloom and they do their own job in their own way so thank you so much for your attention Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dominica, for your insightful and in the nature. You have a uh, lot of trees and the greenery that is in such a romantic city. But how to dealing with the mosquito or other insects problem? <laughs> mm, okay, uh, it's very, uh, very good question. Of course, we have many problems in the city, so it's not uh, always one a perspective uh, solution so that's why i told about the context we need to you know uh, make many analysis and try to deal with this from different angles of course in this uh, project uh, it was the main problem so we deal with you know a lot of greenery and we need to add more uh, but also in different spots we may need different solutions of course so it's all depends on the law on where and what we'd like to change right may i add in johor they have a project mm -hmm. it's about to build in a green uh, city is a real estate project but mm -hmm. now that the project is a decline so yeah because of the insects and the mosquito problems mm -hmm. uh yeah <laughs> you, you think about the, the the problems with mosquitoes right uh, yeah uh, of course, in Poland, we also have problem with mosquitoes, but it's a bit different than here because we have different types of mosquitoes and they are not so dangerous. But we have problem. I think that similar problem we have with ticks, you know, the small bug that can uh, stick to your skin and uh, and drain your blood or something like this, because they are also uh, have some diseases that they can influence and they live in the grass. So we also implement plants that uh, are not good for ticks and uh, it helps and also uh, for I think that for mosquitoes uh, their like enemy are birds and also bats so if you invite more animals like this then you'll have less uh, mosquitoes in terms of ticks they are I don't know there's some uh, bird very um, very similar to chicken but I don't know the English name of it and we also sometimes use those birds they live like in the area but we introduce them you know using their favorite food or anything and they eat those ticks so I think that we can cope with everything also with mosquitoes Okay, if I may add to the question, mm -hmm. just want uh, you to know that I have one uh, PhD student who is doing a, uh, by the name of Li Ji Mei. She's uh, studying how to have a, uh, to have landscape, the type of arrangement, the type of uh, spacing, the type of plants to prevent mosquito. So hopefully uh, we can share the findings soon. Yeah, you'll have the, your solution very soon. <laughs> All right, so yeah, and then it's nature based solution, just like what you the slide, the slide yeah. that you showed before. Everything in the end, the, the, the solution is going back to nature. Yeah. I think this is where it is important that we understand the plants that we have and how we manipulate them and in, re, introduce or reintroduce them inside our community to help yeah, with that, some issues. Yeah, we need to understand our natural processes because mm -hmm. sometimes when we um, when we try to, you know, uh, do something against nature, then we try to have more and more problems. And basically, when you go to this natural circle and you try to understand all the processes, then you'll find your answer. Most of the time, it's just misunderstanding of the process. Uh, hello, I just want to share with you something. If you go uh, regarding to the mosquito problem in urban area here in Malaysia, you like to know if you go to deep in the jungle in Malaysia, there is no mosquito. Yeah, there is no mosquito. Just go to any deep jungle in Malaysia. So how it can happen? So that, that that's the idea. No mosquito. Only in the 
uh, urban or suburban area, we have a mosquito problem. So how how nature did that? So that's the, the issue here. Actually, this time I went to Jomel Island and live in the jungle, then uh, it still have a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, that one is not a, a, a real jungle, a real forest. I mean, the, the, the you know, you go to, uh, for example, like you go to the Royal Bloom, uh, you go to, uh, you know, in Sabah, what they call that? Uh, uh, Dandung Valley, no mosquito. You know, the uh, the real forest, the untouchable, not the untouchable, what they call that. Yeah, just like a virgin forest. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Imran. Mr. Imran is also one of our lecturer here in our faculty. Yeah. So if there's any more questions from the floor? Ah. <laughs> okay. Hi, Dr. Dominica. Um, when I look at your slides and your videos, I saw you had a, a participation from youngsters, children, mm -hmm. uh, young couples. You know, um, if I compare that with Malaysian situation based on my own experience in my own neighborhoods, um, this type of, of activities are normally participated by retirees, mm -hmm. old folks who had no jobs except mingling around with the neighborhood. Um, and I once asked my son to participate mm -hmm. and he said, I had no one else to talk to because I was the only <laughs> young boy there. The rest are all old people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder how did you manage to get youngsters to participate in this kind of activities? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, it was very important for us to reach uh, younger kids because we have huge problem with the population in Poland. So this part of the project was dedicated especially to them. So what we do, we decided to do the easiest way. We reach the local primary school and we first we made a design for them. Then we uh, involve ourselves in their school program. So we start teaching them at school in some extra classes. We built the one of the community gardens there. So they, you know, they were in every their everyday lives. The project appeared. So anytime we make all uh, more uh, events. They were always there because we were all already in some kind of relationship. And also it was the best way to reach parents and other people because those kids went back home and, you know, get, has huge influence on their families because they want to change something and others, they go with these ideas. So it was tricky. Uh, from our side to reach, especially kids in those primary school. Yeah, but it was also all, also a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Anything? Any any other questions? Hello, Doctor Dominica. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. <laughs> uh, I have a question. May I ask the participants to participate in this project or activities? They need to pay, or it's free for them. So if, if it's free, so how can the organization get the funds? Is from the government or from some investi investor? So um, if, if, it's, if, if the organization gets the funds from the government, the government, uh, no? It was no from government. It was from European Union funds. It was a scientific educational project. So the government did not participate in this. Oh. So there was no like, you know, huge pressure or yeah. influence from this side. Of course, later when now they're joining and also the local society, this community ask local government for money for some of their actions that they want to you know conduct in this area but still at the beginning it was money from the different source it was very important uh, as you noticed uh, to be free of this influence of political pressure on on the project okay thank you yeah 
Só que Monica. Uh, Dominica. Monica, yeah. Uh, I have a kind of uh, maybe extended question from uh, students here. When you talk about the government, governments, when I saw your presentation, you work a lot with the urban spaces, small, small urban spaces and so forth. And you say that you got money from EU uh, to, the, to, to do this project, right? So, but anyway, somehow you will have to work with the local government, right? Yeah. Okay, so, but is there any obstacle? What is the major obstacle that you face when you're dealing with them? Because um, from the Malaysian context, um, I do have a hard time working with them in all this bureaucratic and political situation that they impose to us, right? So how you, what is the main obstacle that you face with them and how how you maneuver? How yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> so basically, what are you doing in order to to solve this issue of this uh, political and bureaucratic uh, matter? And we also love signature stamps, bureaucracy, mm. uh, long lines, long time to for approval or of everything and so on. And basically, this was a huge help of our NGO partners because they deal with this every day. And also the NGO that we cooperate with, we start the cooperation, the uh, Urban uh, Design uh, Society. Uh, they are very well known by our local government and they know that they need to work with them in, they, they'd like to be in them with good terms uh, because the impact of this NGO is very huge. So, uh, it's it's not like you know threatening, but uh, the local government knew that we are like a player, like an equal player in this uh, in this process. We need to find a strong NGO. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's easier because yeah. sometimes you know when you work at a university, of course, uh, I can't um, you know force that much uh, with the cooperation with local government, mm -hmm. but the NGO. They can do whatever they want sometimes. So, yeah. you know, it's everyone work cooperating together gives you the best result because we can give the knowledge, the experience, and our approach, and they can give the uh, human power somehow, you know, and this the, the, this kind of um, yeah abilities. Okay. Any more questions? If all right, so thank you again, Dr. Dominica, for your sharing session. And thank you all for your participation and engagement. Uh, we hope that you found Dr. Dominica's presentation both enlightening and thought-provoking. So thank you to the... the deep